everyone. Welcome back to the 100 Days of the 2023 National Electrical Code. My name is Ryan Jackson, and I hope you're having a great day. Let's continue our discussion here in Article 700. In the previous video, we talked about 700.5, which is for bypass isolation transfer switches. In this video, we're going to cover two new sections, 700.11 and 700.27, both of which cover class two lighting and, and basically power over ethernet lighting, if we can just use the real language here. So article 700, 700.11, let's see what it says. Class two systems, new section for systems supplied by a class two circuit was added. Now a class two circuit in, in this context, um, a class two is the, the power source, right? We have, we have class two circuits and we have class three circuits in article 725. Uh, a class two circuit is considered safe from fire and electric shock. We limit the output of the power source, usually the transformer, to a low enough voltage that it's safe from electric shock and low enough current that it's safe from a fire initiation perspective. So usually when we have class two lighting, it's done over what we call power over ethernet. And that's not new, it's relatively new, but it's not new. There, there are whole buildings wired with PoE lighting, but we didn't really have any good language in article 700 to talk about using power over ethernet lighting in an emergency system for the emergency lighting. So we added these two sections. Let's start with 700.11. The line voltage wiring of class two systems must comply with 700.10. All right, so the line voltage, so upstream of the power source, right? Remember, a class two system has to start from a class two power source, something that's listed and marked as class two. So that's going to step the voltage and the current it's going to step the voltage down and limit the current on the output. But what about the line side of that? Well, the line side of that needs to have the same protection requirements that the other wiring of the emergency system has to have. So of course it has to comply with 700.10. So nothing surprising here. The class two circuit itself also needs to comply with B through D and that's mainly the focus that we have here. So B, identification. Emergency circuits must be marked as components of an emergency system as followed. All right, so very similar to the requirements in 700.10, you have a rule here that says boxes and enclosures must be marked, so we need to know that it's an emergency circuit. Number two, exposed cables, raceways, and cable trays must be marked at 25 foot maximum spacings and within three feet of each connector. Okay, so two things here. Number one, I, I like to show a grid ceiling when I talk about concealed wiring methods or exposed wiring methods, excuse me, because a lot of people don't realize that wiring above a suspended ceiling is not concealed, it's exposed. So when you read this rule that says, hey, wherever the cable is exposed, you have to mark it, you know, a lot of people would think, oh, well, it's above the ceiling, it's not exposed. Yes, it is, right? Go to Article 100, exposed wiring methods, wiring behind access panels is considered exposed. Uh, the other thing here is we're talking about 25 foot maximum spacings on the cable. Usually it's going to be like a, a cat six cable and within three feet of each connector. Now, what are the connectors that we're talking about? Well, your typical RJ45, you know, cat six type of termination. So you need to mark the cable every 25 feet and within three feet of the RJ45 to indicate that this thing is a component of an emergency system. Separation. Class two circuits need to be in a jacketed cable or a chapter three wiring method. If it's bundled near other class two circuits, then a separate bundle or non-conductive barrier is required. All right, so we don't want people making the, state, the mistake that they're working on a telecommunication circuit and cutting this CAT6 and finding out that we're knocking out the emergency lighting. So we need to mark the cable, we need to keep it separate from other wiring, and we also have to address the issue of mechanical protection. Uh, normally, when it comes to lights and really just about everything in the NEC, we don't necessarily care if your equipment works. We want to make sure that when it fails, it doesn't kill anybody. Right? That's kind of the whole idea of the NEC but there are a few things that we actually care about the functionality. We care about the functionality of the fire pump. That thing needs to work. We care about the emergency lights. 
those things need to work. So we need to make sure that somebody's not accidentally cutting them, not knowing what it is, and knocking out the power. Class 2 circuits have to be in a raceway, or a cable tray, or MC cable, or AC cable. Uh, this was a little bit controversial because you had people saying, well, you know, we need mechanical protection. And I, quite frankly, I agree. We do need mechanical protection for the emergency lighting system. It's, it's too important to just run it on a Cat 6 up in the ceiling and not protect it. But then you had people saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about the connector? How do I, how do I pull Cat 6 through a conduit if there's a connector on it? And me personally, I'm thinking, well, I don't care. Deal with it. Cut the connector off and re-terminate it. <laughs> Give me a break, right? I mean, you're saying, well, I can't, I can't put the RJ45 through half-inch EMT, so don't make me do that. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. You need to put it in a raceway or a cable tray or MC cable or AC cable. However, they did kind of meet in the middle. Up to six feet of unprotected cable is allowed at emergency luminaires or control devices. All right, so what we're showing here is an actual T-bar, a ceiling grid, that is illuminated. And if you can see in the back here, let me grab my highlighter, right there is my connector. This thing plugs in to a PoE switch. That's how it receives its power. So yes, that might be difficult to put through a conduit. Well, so what? Well, they met, they met in the middle. Up to six feet of unprotected cable is allowed at the emergency illuminaire or control device. I guess the idea here is if you can actually see this cable going to the luminaire, then people know what it is and they're not going to accidentally cut it. Well, that that's good. That, that takes care of the, the mistaken identity issue of people cutting things that they don't know what it is. But what about the physical protection part. Again, I, I think this should probably be in a conduit, but that's just my opinion. Protection is also not required in locked rooms or enclosures that are accessible only to qualified persons. Okay, cool. So I guess the idea is if we have qualified persons, they're less likely to accidentally damage a wiring system. And I, I have no problem with that exception, by the way. So 700.11 kind of tells us how to wire the class two luminaires that are used for emergency lighting. 700.27 also talks about class two systems. Power over ethernet switches and similar must now be listed for emergency use. Seems like a very reasonable requirement to me. If a device combi combines power and control on a class two circuit, then it needs to be listed as an emergency control device. All right, so here we've got our PoE switch if we're using that for emergency lighting, then it needs to be listed for emergency system use. Again, I, I think that's a very reasonable requirement. And then we have an informational note that says a power over ethernet switch is an example of such a device. So yeah, if I was using this as a component of an emergency system, it needs to uh, meet the requirements for emergency lighting. All right, we made it through article 700. Next up is going to be Article 705, Interconnected Electric Power Production Sources. I hope to see you then. Thanks, everybody.